80% of this world's population, 80% of everybody inhabiting this globe that we call home live on less than $10 a day. That calculates to 5.05 billion people that live on less than $10 a day. In the Horn of Africa, over the last six months, more than 30,000 children have died from starvation. In Haiti, only 700 miles from Miami, that's an hour and a half flight, today there are 500,000 orphans. In Honduras, Central America, where we focused our efforts for the last 10 years, today there are 250,000 orphans. In Honduras, 44% of the population lives on less than $4 a day. And in Honduras, 24% of the population lives on less than $2 a day. In Choloteca, which is the southern region of, the Hondur of Honduras, on the Pacific coast, it's the name of the, the province there, 90% of all arrests made, 90% of everyone bought in and booked in a developing nation that's rampant with crime, but 90% of everyone brought in, they brought in for sex crimes. 70% of that 90%, 70% of that 90%, 70% of those sex crimes are incestual in nature. In the rural mountain villages where we focus a lot of our efforts, the generally accepted marrying age for a young girl is 12 years old. In those same villages where the farmers live entirely off what they produce, if there's a bad crop, if there's drought that prevents the crop from producing, or if there's extreme flood like we saw last month, the whole family will go hungry. There's no Willie Nelson's farm aid concert to raise money. There's, there's no crop insurance to provide. It's hungry bellies. There's one public hospital to serve this region, built in about 1948. It's where the, the local city where you go to die. In this region, it's not uncommon for a single mother of five or six kids from just as many men to be faced with a real struggle of what to do when her child has a common cold or a simple urinary tract infection, things that we take for granted because we can run down to Walgreens and pick up some NyQuil or we can get a prescription of amoxicillin and go to Publix where they'll even give you this prescription. It's so common. These simple sicknesses have life or death consequences so many times for so many people in the third world. It's also not uncommon for a well-intentioned American, but maybe you've not gotten to know many people in, the, in developing nations. It's not uncommon for that well-intentioned American to get to know right away that woman and find out that she's got five or six kids from just as many men, and it's also not uncommon for that American to judge that woman before he finds out that she was part of that 70% statistic, a victim herself at age 12, bearing a child shortly thereafter, then not able to go to school because she's raising a child with no education and no man to provide for her family. She has to do awful, horrible things, sacrificing her body to provide for her family. And I will never judge that woman who does what she can to provide for her family. You know, it seems apparent to me that our world is hemorrhaging. It seems apparent to me that the divide between what we consider normal and what 5.05 billion people, what 80% of this globe consider normal. It seems apparent to me that our society cannot sustain such a divide for too much longer. International news and the Internet have brought these things to our attention, have opened our eyes to what's going on around the world. It's a lot like a, a bad car accident. And the paramedics show up, and they're very careful to put the neck brace on the victim, to, to cut them out of the car with the jaws of life, get them on the backboard, load them into the ambulance. There may not be any bones sticking out of the skin, no blood running out of the face. But at the end, they slowly cut away the clothes and the shoes and, and put them into the x-ray or the CAT scan machine. And only then, after they take a closer look inside is the true damage revealed, the hemorrhaging, the internal hemorrhaging that is sucking the life out of that person. Only then, after the layers are peeled away, is the reality apparent. That's a lot of the people that we feel called to serve 
in Honduras and in Haiti, people who have such little things, so such little things compared to what we have here in the U.S. You know, when I showed up in Honduras, I had a business degree from Abilene Christian. Uh, I had a lot of uh, experiences growing up in the church. I had the few token scriptures memorized, Acts 238, 23rd Psalms. I was a great, you know, uh, product of the Church of Christ. But I'd never spent any time to plan a class or, or to put together a sermon. Didn't know how to do it. And all of a sudden, the local preachers were asking me to go and to, to get into a village and share the good news with someone. I didn't know how to do that, and I didn't have Lifeway that I could run down to, to, to pick up some preacher outlines, some sermon outlines, and the internet connection was too slow to try to download some. Believe me, I tried. And so I started flipping through the New Testament and came across these great things, these parables. Oh, they're so great, the red letters. You don't have to be a theologian to understand them. You don't have to look for the hidden meaning in them. It's right there in front of you most of the time. They're time-tested truths that were applicable 2,000 years ago, and they're applicable today, even here in our developed nation. And then as I kept looking around, I found something even better. It was just as if I'd had lunch with Mark, and, and he'd given me notes from the previous week's sermon and it was Christ's Sermon on the Mount, right there for me, just for me to use. And so I got ready, and, and I prepared my talk, and, and I show up in the village, and, and we're in this woman's house. Her stick walls, the walls made out of little, actually little sticks. If you're from out in the West Texas, we'd call them stays. You put in your fence to make your fence stay up. And the roof was pieces of tin and, and pieces of plastic and broken clay tiles. Dirt floor that followed the contour of the land. It rained hard. Water come in one side and rush right out the other. Five kids. Mom, one hammock and some pieces of cardboard. The floor, the same moisture content as the jungle floor surrounding the home. Gaping cracks in the walls where, where a, a cougar or a mountain lion could come right in. And I prepared my, my talk to share with this woman. And I was so proud of myself. I was going to share some things that were just simple, common truths that my whole Christianity was based upon. And so if you want to join me in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, if you want to meet me there. I shared some words from Christ. The red letters, not a whole lot of debate going on. As to whether they're real or not, not a whole lot of debate is what the real meaning was. They're the red letters, the foundation of our faith. Christ says here, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? I was so proud of my lesson that I put together to share with this woman in her hut with her hungry children in midst of poverty that is oftentimes hard to even understand. And just as soon as the words came out of my mouth, after I finished reading the text that my whole study was based upon, it hit me like a ton of bricks in the face that these words, these simple truths that mean so much to me, I realized were a lie to that woman that I was sharing them with. I realize now that to so many people on the globe, these words, these simple truths are not only a lie, they're quite ironic to people all over this globe. And I didn't know what to do with that. My paradigm was shifted, and I didn't know how to reconcile it. And it took me on a journey. And I hope you'll follow me on that journey this morning. From there, I went to realize that we learned from Paul that we've been reconciled through Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 17 18 through there we learn that we reconciled through christ but then paul goes on to say in verse 20 therefore you are now ambassadors christ's ambassadors as though god were making his appeal through you so what do we do with that word ambassador you know we we hear it a lot and, and i heard it all of my life growing up 
But it wasn't until I was in a third world country and it wasn't until there was a coup three or four years ago that it really hit home what the ambassador does. He's there in that foreign land to represent us. So when there was a coup in midst of 24-hour curfew for 12 days, when we were on lockdown, I would get emails from the ambassador's office, the embassy where the ambassador's at, telling the U.S. citizens what the situation was like. They were there to fill us in. They represent us over there. If you're traveling in France and you're in a bad car accident and things happen, you know that you can go and call upon the embassy, the office of the U.S. ambassador, to find out what you can do. The ambassador is there to represent your interests in that foreign land. He's appointed by the President of the United States. And I believe that, and I know that the, pre, the ambassador to, say, Afghanistan has a lot of much different life experiences that have adequately prepared him to be in Afghanistan that are probably going to be very different than, let's say, the ambassador to Canada. And it's not in spite of those experiences that the president chose that man to go to Afghanistan, but because of those life experiences. They have prepared him to be able to serve appropriately in Afghanistan. Likewise, we are Christ's ambassadors here on this earth. We are here to represent him. You know, it's really trendy. It's really great to call yourself a Christian these days. Uh, you got Christian bookstores everywhere, Christian radio stations. I travel all over no matter where I go. I can always turn down to the 80s for some reason. The 80s on the dial and I can find a Christian radio station. We all got our cross necklaces. I got mine on today. We love to have a little fish sticker on our car, but yet mouth something at someone who cuts us off. The title Christian's real trendy. But Paul tells us that if we've been reconciled through Christ, that's how we become a Christian. We give our life to Jesus. Our sins are taken away. We're reconciled. If you're not a numbers person, that means there's no debt. You're in the black out of the red. It means if you got a little booklet from the bank when you got a car loan, every month you tear out a page from your book, you mail it in with your check. When all those pages are gone, it's reconciled. You're free. It feels really good. We've got an amazing weight on us called sin, but when we give our life to Jesus, it's gone. He takes it away. It's paid for. It's done with. Therefore, once we become Christians, we are ambassadors. We can't choose to be a Christian. Well, now I've got to work some things out. Oh, I need to learn a little bit more. Oh, well, you know, I've got to get some... Sing some things in order. No, once you give your life to Christ, then you are His ambassador. You then represent Him. At least that's the charge that we've been given. But maybe you're sitting there saying, well, hey, little missionary boy, you don't know me. You don't know where I came from. You don't know what happened to me. You don't know my baggage. You don't know my wounds. You don't know my abuse. You don't know how little education I have or how much you have. You don't know how much money I may or may not have. You know, I can't go do that. You're right, I don't. But the moment God decided that He was going to make His appeal through you as His ambassador, He said, I can use this person because I know what they've been through. And I know that they are specially equipped because just like that ambassador to Afghanistan, the life experience of this person are going to enable this person to minister in a way that maybe I can't. The life experiences of Mark Howell have equipped him to minister in a way that are probably quite different from other people in this room. And it's not in spite of those experiences. It's not in spite of those wounds. It's not in spite of that baggage. It's not in spite of your socioeconomic level. It's not in spite of your education level. It's because of it that God can use you. God is waiting on you to get to work for Him. You know, it's, it's real easy to get overwhelmed missionary guy shows up and starts off with a whole slew of statistics that are quite frankly appalling. 70% incestual sex crimes? Give me a break! 
It's easy to get overwhelmed. I think it's easy to get overwhelmed right here in the meadows at the grove. Statistics tell me there's people here who have been wronged. There's people here who have deep wounds, injustices that should not have happened to them, deaths, sickness that they don't understand. It's easy to get overwhelmed in Houston. Even in the southwest part of Houston, which is so oftentimes recognizes with opulence and wealth, there's a lot of need. In the Horn of Africa, in Haiti, Honduras, you don't have to go real far to find need. It's overwhelming, and sometimes it's so easy to want to say, God, where are you? Let the children come to you, God. Why don't you show up? Why don't you come on and be here so that the children can come to you? Why don't you do something from time to time? Cynical is easy. Cynical simple. Requires nothing of us. Just a nice little rant. When, when you're unloading, you're upset because something happened in your life or to some folks you saw on a mission trip, God is looking down and He's mourning with you. He's mourning with you because He's saying, I chose people specially equipped to represent me in your situation or in that situation and they didn't do their job. I killed my son so that they would have the authority to be there in your situation and, it, and they didn't show up. My ambassadors did not show up. I'm convinced that for every injustice, for every battered wife, there is somebody who knows that something is going on and due to fear has not gotten involved. I'm convinced that for every child that is abused, there is somebody that knows something is going on and has not gotten involved. I'm convinced that for every home destroyed by a man running around doing things he shouldn't be doing, there is somebody that should have held that man accountable. I'm convinced that for every person that has died in the last eight months in the Horn of Africa starving, that there was a lot of people around this globe who tuned into Anderson Cooper 360 every night. And maybe we've not done as much as we could as Christ's ambassadors here on this earth. We can't get discouraged, though. We can't consider it all for naught, you know. Like I said, Anderson Cooper does a great job discouraging Discouraging us every night. It's not all for naught. The battle has been won. We're just trudging through some things. Do we will all be able to claim our prize? But you know, ministry is nasty and dirty. An elder once told me it'd be so much easier doing this ministry stuff if humans weren't involved. You know, there's fears of getting involved. It's not my deal. It's not my problem. I don't want the drama. Churches, churches that are doing a whole lot are always wound up in drama. Great. Great. That means you're doing something. And then when we go on these international trips, well, then there's sickness. You know, they got that malaria over there in Honduras. Don't want to get that malaria. I preached in Philadelphia last week, and there's an elder there who can't hardly walk. He's being crippled from the West Nile virus, from a mosquito that picked him in Phil that, 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 that bit him in Philadelphia, USA. Oh, it's dangerous. Oh, they're killing people. Got a phone call last week from a church in Dallas. You know what? We're canceling our trip next year because they murdered some people on the north coast of Honduras. I turned on the TV last night at 10 o'clock and it scared me to death right here in Houston. No, seriously. It was pretty overwhelming how many people were murdered in the last week here in Houston. It's like saying, I'm not going to go down to Nashville and visit those folks because they're murdering people in South Central L.A. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what might happen is so powerful. Fear is this force, this emotion that is so powerful. But folks, I look at you and I tell you today that if we can harness that fear and recognize it for what it is, we can do amazing things with it. Because that fear can be taken advantage of by God and by Satan. But I believe, I believe that probably 
the vast majority of the times that we're put in situations to make a decision, I believe that fear wins out. I believe that fear wins out and we don't do anything. And we never know what might have been. Fear, it's a weakness for a type A personality like me. That's the last thing you want to really recognize that you have is a weakness. But when you can recognize that fear for what it is and get on your knees, Paul tells us, for when we are weak, then we'll be strong. But it changes completely because it's no longer about me. It's not about what I was able to do. It's about what God was able to do through me. And it's amazing. It's powerful. And lives are transformed in amazing ways. I came across a scripture a few years ago, and it's really transformed the way I look at everything. And it's really amazing how we can grow up going to church and grow up looking at certain texts and reading them through a certain set of filters on our lenses. And we can sometimes, if it's the way we've always done it, we'll read it for exactly what it says and we'll interpret it for exactly what it says. Or if it's the way we don't really feel comfortable, then we talk about the context by it and explain it away a different way. And sometimes we try to make too much out of simple texts. I mentioned too, I'm not a theologian. And I don't want to get involved in the debates of whether it's ethical for today or if it's just passed away or whatever. You know what? In Honduras, we got so many people with basic spiritual needs. Who's Jesus? What's he done? And how can I be a part of it? You all leave that debate of all those different things in the U.S. Give me the red letters. I don't have to be a theologian to understand them. They're pretty simple, and they're good. They are so good. And if you look at it every day, then it's new every day. Therefore, we get good news. It's good, and it's new. John 14, 12, if you want to meet me there, is good. And for me, it's really new. Christ's words here in John, Christ's words... Amazing words, actually. NIV version, I guess translation is about 30 years old or so. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing also. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Well, key word I threw in there, two words. I didn't throw them in. Christ threw them in there. If you have faith in me. Well, we all know how dangerous that little word faith is. We've all read that if we had the faith the size of a mustard seed, we could holler at those hills over by Kerrville, and they'd jump up and they'd be over here by Galveston Bay. But those hills are still over there. And all of us have prayed things earnestly on our knees, cried prayers, and they didn't happen the way we wanted it to happen. And so our cop-out then is... I guess I just didn't have the faith the size of a mustard seed. I really like my Bible. It's got Spanish and English side by side. The Spanish NIV, I really love. It's a very new translation. It was translated from the original text to Spanish, not from English to Spanish. And it's only about 15 years old. And according to the theologians, they're constantly learning ways to better interpret the original manuscripts. It shows... In John 14, 12, in Spanish. I'll read it to you in English, but directly translating. Certainly I assure you that he who believes in my works that I do, he also will do them. Folks, that's a powerful change of words. Because I believe that the blind man could see. I believe the lame man walked. I believe he picked up in his bed and ran. And I believe 5,000 people were fed from a few fishes and a few loaves. And I believe that a Samaritan woman by a well received an amazing message of love. And I don't know if you understand how important that is. 
But that Samaritan woman today, the Samaritans are called Palestinians and Christ was a Jew. And this battle in Palestine, in Israel, is not something new. It's been going on for a long time. These folks have hated each other for thousands of years. And Christ not only went to a race that was despised by his race, but to a woman who was of a horrible reputation and did not judge her, but preached love to her. I believe those stories as real. Do you believe those stories are real? Not leaving it up for interpretation. Not going to see what Peter said. Not going to see what Paul said. Not going to see what Timothy said. Christ's words. Christ says, if you believe these works are true that I've been doing, then you too will do them. That's powerful. That's huge. I don't know if it means we're going to go down the street or to St. Luke's and we're going to find someone from a car crash who's had their arm chopped off. I don't know if it means we're going to pray over them and they're going to have a claymation new arm sprout. But I do know that for us in the United States of America, in Houston, it's been quite frankly pretty blessed through the economy downturn. A lot of oil here and it's kept things moving. I do know that for us, we've got influence. As Americans, we've got influence. I don't care what your socioeconomic level is. I don't care what your education level is. I don't care your background. We've got influence as Americans. If you travel outside of our borders, we have influence. You can say something. You can share the good news, and people will listen. Okay, we've got money. Again, I don't care what your socioeconomic level is. I don't care what assistance you might be on or might not be on. We've got money in the U.S. We have money, and money in this world is power. We can transform lives because... I still had a huge issue to resolve about a woman in a hut that I was sharing something valuable to me with her, and it was a lie. And then it hit me. Those are promises. That woman should not have to worry about what she's going to do. And when a group of folks from the Grove, a group of folks from Sugar Grove Church of Christ, a group of folks who left out of the meadows and went to Honduras and spent a little bit of money and bought some sacks of food and when you showed up in a woman's home who wasn't signed up in a lottery to maybe get gone, visited, she wasn't told, hey, come to church all week and maybe you'll get something. She wasn't said, jump in this pool of water and do it right and we'll bless you. A woman who had no idea that she would be blessed. A woman struggling to provide for her five or six kids from just as many men. A woman with a bad, painful past. When a group of Americans showed up in her home, you were the fulfillment to that promise that Christ made her 2,000 years ago when he preached that sermon. You were just as important to that miracle as those fishes and those loaves were when Christ fed 5,000. You were the means, the mechanism, the tool, the instrument that God used to work a modern-day miracle in that woman's life. Don't belittle it and say, well, it's just a $40 sack of food. When you have nothing, when you have nothing. Let's put it in real terms here in Houston. You're out of work. You're unemployed. You have a hungry family. You got a mortgage. You got sick kids. And you have no food in the pantry. A stranger shows up at your door and leaves you a check that's going to cover your monthly mortgage, your health insurance, your medical bills, and your food, your car note. That's, what, that's how that relates to us. Calculating for inflation, that's how it calculates. What about that would not be miraculous? When we as ambassadors step out and allow the Holy Spirit to work through us, Amazing things can happen even greater than just feeding 5,000 people with some fishes and some loaves. It's good to unload. We've got this weird feeling, it seems like, in our church culture in the U.S. that we have to keep an arm's distance, arm's length from God. We can't let God know how we feel. God wants that intimate relationship. 
with us. The prophets had that intimate relationship. We read about the prophets. We put the prophets up here on this pedestal as if they were some kind of quasi-gods. They were regular people. James tells us that Elijah was a regular Joe, just a normal dude. The Spanish translation said he has the same weaknesses as everyone else. But they had a unique intimacy with God. They could unload with God, but very different from the way most of us might unload. After unloading, they would shut up and listen to what God had to say. I think that some amazing things are happening. I believe it. I've seen it. The whole story of what I've been able to be a part of at Mission Lazarus is amazing. People come up and, oh, man, we just appreciate it. If you go down there, you'll see right away it's so big and so amazing. It's not about me. It's hard to believe. Habakkuk wrote some words many, many years ago but he could have wrote them for the evening commentary on last night's news. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous, so that justice is perverted. Then Habakkuk sits and listens for the Lord's answer. Verse 5. Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. There's a lot of young folks getting out of school today, and a lot of us older folks tell them they got these idealistic views, and they really need to get a reality check. I'm convinced that when we allow the Holy Spirit to work through our idealistic views, then all of a sudden we have reality and things are changed. A few years ago, we had an airplane crash in Honduras. Taka Airlines, you might have heard of them. They're endearingly known as Take a Chance Airlines. Landed in Tegucigalpa, the shortest international commercial runway in the world, with a tailwind in a hurricane. The plane got to the end of the runway and was not done sliding and went off the runway onto the city streets. It was the middle of group season. We had all these groups coming in. They all had to go to the north coast and take a bus down to where we were at. Well, my wife and kids were going to be traveling to the U.S. during that time, and so they joined one of these groups as they were leaving for the 10-hour bus ride back to the North Coast. I went along with them. We got to San Pedro Sula, spent the night. The next day, they flew out to the U.S. I could not take another bus ride for 10 hours back home. I just couldn't do it. So the, 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 the airport in Tegucigalpa was still open to national flights, to little puddle jumper flights. So for $150, I bought a plane ticket on one of these planes. Now, I fly a lot. I've got the uh, uh, elite one-pass status and, and get to all those little nice upgrades, but I'm not comfortable with flying at all. I've not ever been. I can't stand it. I don't understand how that hunk of metal stays in the air. Somebody in the hall this morning, a pilot, tried to explain it to me. I really wasn't interested because... He heard me say the same thing in first service, and it doesn't make sense. It's a big hunk of metal. And so we get into our plane, which was just about a 10-passenger plane. And when I was a kid, the vehicle of choice, which we didn't have one, was the Caprice Classic station wagon. Y'all remember the Caprice Classic station wagon? The back seat turned around and faced backwards. For a kid, that was awesome. I remember that. Our neighbors had one. This airplane looked a lot like a Caprice Classic station wagon with wings. There was no special TSA regulations that kept the pilot separate from us. They were sitting right there with us. And I remember being impressed as we pulled up, as he's trying to take off, watching the two pilots holding those two sticks, pull them back, and seeing their forearms flex. Didn't realize how much effort went into it. And also I remembered as I looked up front, and it was getting kind of hot, and the pilot had his vent window open. Well, my first truck was a 79 F100. 
and it had a vent window. Y'all remember the vent window? You could flip it around and it shot wind on you. It felt almost, almost like air conditioning, except it wasn't cold air. And just like on my 79 F100, the vent window has a piece of chrome around the appendable part of the window and a piece of felt around the main part of the window. And when that chrome and felt came together, that was your weather stripping. And just like in my 79 F100, where in the 90s, that felt had long since dry rotted and was gone and didn't make a good seal and water would drip in on me when it rained. As we were flying up in the clouds, water started dripping in through the vent window, dropping down on the pilot's fleet, then slowly going past us because we're at a slight pitch like that. And I guess it went out the back door. The tallest mountain hunter is about 6,000 feet, so I assume we're at about 7,500 feet. No radar, no fancy instruments flying by sight. And it's the rainy season, so we're in clouds, and it's completely white. And I'm starting to get nervous because there's something about little plains and mountains in Latin America. It's like trailer parks and tornadoes in the U.S. They always seem to meet each other. And I started getting worried. It's only about a 25-minute fight. 25 minutes comes and goes. 35 minutes, come and go. 45 minutes and we're still in the clouds and white out. We could have done the trip twice now. And I'm really worried. And I assume by this point the pilot was getting a little worried as well because apparently he was lost. So he takes the plane down just a little bit, pops out of the clouds. Now those of you who've been to Honduras, you might recall about an hour and a half south of the capital, there's a big reservoir and a big dam. South of the capital. We started on the north coast, Tegucigalpa, dam. We popped out of the clouds over the reservoir, past the capital. We'd missed our destination. So the pilot turned the plane back around, flew back in under the clouds, and we made a safe landing. So you're probably recognizing where I'm going with this. Our culture, our society, our Christianity, if we want to get personal, our Christianity is flying in the clouds. And there are disasters all around us. Not waiting to happen, but have already happened. And it's time that we came out of the clouds and looked at reality and did something about it. We can do amazing things right here in the meadows in southwest Houston, in Houston, in the U.S., or in Timbuktu and beyond. I praise you all today for being so missions-minded, and I pray that you will be bold and know that you can make a difference in this world. God bless you all. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Hearts full of praise, so be exalted, O Lord, my And the congregation said, hey, dude, Jared, thank you so much for being with us today. I appreciate the passion and that energy and that vitality. It's, you, it's been a blessing. We praise God for your work and for what you brought to us here today.